Hello, today we're going to have a look at mutations. Um, we have three things that we need to look at today. The first is to be able to describe factors that can lead to increased rates of DNA mutation. We need to have a brief understanding of the main types of DNA mutation. Most importantly for us is to explain the effects of mutations on protein structure and protein function. So let's kick this off by thinking about what we know already. Have a look at the list of pictures and think which do not cause DNA mutations to happen. So there's three things that we should have picked out and all of them are to do with non-ionizing radiation so that we know that using LCDs in your TV screens, Wi-Fi and communications through your phones all emit some form of radiation but the difference is between ionizing radiation that damages cells and non-ionizing sources that we currently have little evidence to suggest they do cause um, problems with your DNA. So let's look at the way that mutations arise naturally. First off, uh, when you are copying the DNA in every single cell as it divides through mitosis, there is a little bit of room for error. It's very, very rare and it doesn't happen often because your DNA polymerase has a very high fidelity or a high accuracy rate. But sometimes, just through DNA replication, you can cause a mutation. Another source are mutagenic chemicals um, that contain different substances that can interact with DNA and harm cells and that causes a mutation or ionizing radiation. So if we have a look at those two chemical types, um, the first off if you're using chemicals that can directly alter the structure of the DNA or they could interfere in transcription, so that means that your DNA code is okay but when it gets copied over into mRNA to be used as the instructional template for producing a protein, that process could go wrong and you could get the wrong protein made. The second is ionizing radiation, particularly with high energy, because this will interact with the DNA and physically disrupt its structure. So as you well know, x-rays that accumulate over time, that can be damaging ultraviolet radiation from the sun or alpha and beta particles from radioactive sources can do this. And we hear the word mutations thrown around a lot, so let's do a bit of myth busters right now. Does a mutation give you a new fantastic beast or some sort of crazy zombie? So that is a no. Really, uh, mutations could be very small scale. They could happen at individual points across your DNA molecule. It might disrupt a gene and give you a physical trait that you could see, such as an extra Lego on this little lamb, or it might cause a protein to be built differently so you see a different shape. Um, but a lot of them are going to be molecular based if they show all. So we're going to look in particular at how your proteins are affected on, in a cellular level or on a just single molecule base level. So that is the factors that can lead to increased rates of DNA mutation. The next step is putting it into practice and knowing what some of these mutations are. And in order to do this properly and do it justice, we have to go back to DNA as your instructional template. Because we know the DNA is used to make a transcript of mRNA and that mRNA will leave the nucleus and go to a ribosome and help form the amino acid sequence, also known as a polypeptide chain. And this polypeptide chain will then later fold into a functional protein. So an overall summary of what we know so far is that DNA will be transcribed by RNA polymerase in the nucleus. mRNA will be translated using tRNA at the ribosome to form an amino acid sequence, which then is going to fold. And when it's folding, it's getting a more complicated structure and a more particular or specific shape. So that shape is going to be held in place by hydrogen bonds between the R groups on amino acids to form a secondary protein structure. And then to get even more complicated, that secondary structure is going to twist around and get bonded some more using ionic and disulfide bonds to form a tertiary, and if you have more than two proteins, a quaternary structure. And there you go, you've got a lovely functional protein. So let's look at how DNA is read. With our reading frames, we're thinking about where our codons are and where, how we're reading them from. Where's our start point? Because we know that DNA, you can look at it without any of the other annotations, it's just a list of bases, isn't it? And you could start reading from that first base and group your triplets from there because each mRNA can be read in three different ways depending on where your start codon is. 
So wherever we put this start code on, it makes sure that we're reading the correct frame. So looking at the different frames, you have the starting from the first base in the series, the second base in the series, and the third base in the series. And from that point, we can make our group of three, our triplet code, to read out one code on, and that will choose a particular amino acid later. So a frame shift mutation is something that can occur that changes the frame of the mRNA being made. Um, and this means that when we're reading our mRNA, if we needed, let's say, frame 1 to make the correct amino acid, an issue if you push it along to the third frame means that we're making completely different things. And let's look at this a bit more clearly. So here I have a sequence of DNA, and I'm going to show in red boxes each codon that would be read. So you have the first codon CAT, the second codon TAT, and the third codon CAG. And the amino acid sequence is determined using those sequences of codons, so we would have amino acids 1, 2, and 3, for example. But if we have a big frame shift, let's say that your whole sequence gets invaded by one extra amino acid that's inserted. Sorry, not amino acid, one extra nucleotide that's inserted. Let's put our frames back around so we can read our codons. So our first codon is unaffected, it's still CAC, but this one, the second codon, has been affected by the frame shift. We've added an extra amino acid in there, and another nucleotide in there, and so we don't have the same codon anymore. Following that, the third codon is also affected because everything has been shifted to the right by one position. So other than that first amino acid, which is encoded, the second and the third are going to be affected. So the amino acid sequence downstream from the mutation is affected. We can look at this again when we look at our frame shifts for two different sorts. So we had an example of an insertion already where you're adding in a single nucleotide, but you can also cause a frame shift by deleting a single nucleotide and that is going to shift everything along to the left instead. So when we put our codons back in, you can have a read, and we notice that here we have the same sequence, we have another sequence here that's been affected, and the third one is most particularly affected because the more downstream you go, the more codons are going to be affected by this. So in the case of our deletion mutation, you notice that we have an incomplete third codon, so this amino acid might not be synthesized at all. So again, in a frame shift, the amino acid sequence downstream from the mutation is affected. But when we talk about DNA, going back to this process at the beginning, I know if I produce a mutation up here or up here, so my DNA or my mRNA is affected, the whole consequence is that you get a protein that doesn't work or is in slightly different shape sometimes. So we need to think about on the level of a protein, how will a mutation in the DNA cause a final consequence down here? So looking through, our primary structure will be affected because when we code for a different amino acid, we get a different R group on that amino acid. And this is going to mean we have a different sequence of amino acids. Because we know that bonds can occur between R groups, this is going to affect the secondary structure. So we're going to change the position of bonds, potentially, the alpha helix and the beta sheets. Because your secondary structure is needed in order to coil and form further bonds in that tertiary structure, we're going to change overall the specific 3D shape of the protein. So a frame shift mutation could have quite profound effects. Next, let's look at if there's no frame shift. So if we still have a mutation, but it doesn't have as much of an impact on the overall protein. So some things that can happen is that a mutation might substitute one single amino acid. So looking at your point mutation over here, you notice that this base used to be a thymine and that's been changed to a cytosine. This might have a very small effect sometimes. Some mutations might be silent. So let's say we do have this substitution, but we don't change the amino acid encoded because looking at our DNA code, we know that it's degenerate. We know that there are multiple codons to get the same amino acid, and that's shown with brackets here. So here you have an amino acid coded as Arch, and you can see that there are four different codons that would give you the same outcome, the same amino acid. So there's a potential 
for let's say CGU to be the original codon and that gets changed to CGC and that still makes the same amino acid. So there's two types of mutations that we could talk about. Either looking at this base over here, we could say that that gets substituted and this might change the protein. But a silent mutation is different. Let's say that we have another protein down here um, and we're coding this protein and we notice that the first codon is unaffected, the second codon we have this substitution in that third position, but thinking back to our degenerate code, it still would make the same sequence. Now, I've been through the main types with you, and I checked a load of different mark schemes to see if you would need any specific details. And we notice in the first two, the main message that we need to bring home is that we have a mutation occurring that changes the amino acid sequence or the primary structure sequence. This is going to affect the bonding and therefore folding and overall the shape of the protein those themes stay. But in one of them we found a bit more detail, so I know that this shouldn't be used as an example of what could come up in all of your exams, but just to be safe, just to make sure I've taught you a bit more rather than a bit less, we're going to look at two more examples. So you could get asked a question that suggests that a whole codon was changed at the end. So let's say that we have a mutation here there, instead of being in our second position TAT, that could change to TAG. And then we have something called a nonsense mutation, where one base is substituted to form a stop codon, and this is prematurely ending translation. So what happens here is your first codon and your second codon can be read, but unfortunately you make one amino acid, and instead of the next amino acid, which would have been two, that's read as a stop, so you don't make the third one. So you get a prematurely short protein. You might imagine where this mutation could happen in your sequence. So let's say we have two sequences here and we think about where we might be able to place that mutation. If my mutation happens right at the end of the protein and this section isn't made, you can obviously see that the majority of the protein is intact. This would be expected to have a much less significant effect. But if this mutation were to happen towards the beginning of the sequence, then all of this bit doesn't get made in translation. So it could have a much more profound effect. Another type that we can look at is inversion mutations. And this is where a section of a chromosome breaks, rotates 180 degrees, and then rejoins with the two end fragments. So I'm going to show you an example, and I want you to focus on this sort of middle bit here. What we have is the chromosome inverting, you can see it really bending there, and instead of reading ABC, that reads AED, because E and D from this side have snapped off and rotated, so all of this middle section has rotated around 180 degrees and joined on again. So this is an inversion. Another uh, possibility that can happen is something called translocation mutation. And this is a much bigger break. So instead of just having one chromosome looking like this with A, B, C, D, E, F, you have two chromosomes present. One section is going to break off and swap and reattach on the other chromosome. So we can see our translocation has transplanted all of this from one chromosome, substituting in this place here. So we have a change to both the length of the DNA potentially and also the sequence. Let's put this into practice. I'd like you to pause for a moment and have a look at this. And we have a section of DNA has the following sequence. State the type of mutation that has taken place in each of the following variants of this DNA. So compare your original sequence right next to all of the others and work out what type of mutation has happened. Give it a go. Okay, let's look through. Um, for ease of comparison, I've just popped uh, the code down here. So we're going to see all of the different codes come up and we're going to move it down next door and compare the sequence to the original. In our first one, we notice that there is a deletion mutation. One of the bases has been removed. In the next one, we have an inversion mutation where a section has broken off and it's swapped around and now it looks the opposite. Then we have a missense mutation, followed by an addition mutation where a single base has been added. 
So score yourself out of four there, see if you've been able to identify the main types of DNA mutation. Lastly, we have the opportunity to look at some of the applications of this. And it's so important that we study mutations and really get familiar with them in this era where we have more technology to be able to do this. And sometimes a very you know, insignificant seeming single base substitution can cause an entire protein to be working improperly. It's broken. So this mutated protein might mean that a person lives but with quite significant effects on their body and their ability to do things. Or it could be that there's a multiple range of mutations that could happen to all cause the same or very similar conditions. And one example that we learn in our specification is about cystic fibrosis. So we should be familiar with the CFTR protein from our previous lessons. So the CFTR protein is going to be involved in um, regulation of chloride ions in the balance of water between the mucus and across the epithelium. And this is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein. To remind you, it's a gated protein channel in the cell membrane. And we might have learned in GCSE that one mutation in one base causes a disease, but this one has over 1,700 different variants that can cause that disease. So anywhere in the long sequence of the genetic code that makes the CFTR protein, in any of those 1,700 different mutations that can happen, cause this. So it's a lot more complicated in reality. And we need to think about heredity too. How do you pass a genetic mutation from the parent to the child? And this happens through mutations being present in the germline, in those gametes. So these are the cells that lead towards you developing either sperm or eggs. This can happen in two different situations. Either you are born with a mutation in all of your germline cells, so all of your eggs and sperm will carry the mutation. Or it could well be that a single egg or sperm in your body is mutated, so its genetic material is changed, but the others are okay. And in particular, you might notice that the risk of mutation increases significantly with age. So we want to put together a few things now. We've learned about the different types of mutations. We have learned about proteins and how bonding and all these different things affect protein structure. So um, there are three questions um, you, that you'd have in your booklets on Moodle if you were in my class. Have a look through and answer away. If you feel like you need a bit more help, it might be useful to go back and think about protein structures and it might be useful to go back and think of some key words from this lesson. So looking at the beginning, we are adding in a single base and we know that this is going to be happening in your DNA sequence and yet your questions are talking about an effect on a polypeptide. So the first thing that you might need to go back and remember is what is a polypeptide? What is that made out of? The next thing is that you've got the same thing happening, so we're still adding a base in, but it could either have a considerable effect or little effect on this polypeptide produced. Think of why this might happen. Why might in one protein it be significantly affected and the other only a little bit? The next one, you have a mutation causing three bases of the DNA of a gene to become duplicated you need to explain how the effects of this mutation might differ if the dupl duplicated bases are consecutive rather than in three separate locations on the DNA molecule. In the booklets I've provided for my class, you have some diagrams to help you imagine this. The last one is suggesting two reasons why the addition of a single base into a DNA sequence may not alter the amino acid sequence in the resultant polypeptide. So why might, if you add a single base, there is no change overall in amino acid sequence? Give it a go. Let's look through our answers. So, the first question asks us why there might be a considerable effect on the polypeptide produced. And the first thing that we need to have come to mind is about frame shifts. In a frame shift, codons will be read differently as the reading frame is shifted to the right by one base. If this is inserted near the beginning of the sequence, most codon, uh, co sorry, codons will be changed 
therefore the sequence of amino acids will be affected greatly. So if we think about our amino, our base sequence before, if we had one, two, three, four, five, six bases in our sequence, and instead we shoved one extra base in right here at the beginning, then I would read one, two, three here instead of how it should be read normally in green as one, two, three bases here. That means the next codon should have been over here, reading these one, two, three bases together. But in actuality, now I'm starting in this position and reading across, and so on. So the earlier in the sequence this happens, the more codons downstream get kicked out of the right sequence. Next up, we're thinking about little effect on the polypeptide produced. So for this one, if we're inserting the extra base near the end of the sequence, less codons will be changed. And because we know what codons do, codons are going to code for amino acids, so less amino acids in the polypeptide chain will be unaffected or only slightly affected. Next up we can have a look at the next one. So, a mutation causes three bases in the DNA of a gene to become duplicated. You need to explain how the effects of this mutation might differ if the duplicated bases are consecutive, one after the other, rather than in three separate locations on the DNA molecule. What we need to do is imagine our codons in our reading frame again. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, and another one, two, three, following our triplet code. So we have protein one, we have a different protein coded here by the addition, and we have amino acid two, protein two. Let's get our codons out again for separate, and we're going to go through, add in our reading frame, add in those codons that are pulled out, and we notice that we have a little interfering extra base in each one as we go down. So, in a consecutive mutation there is no frame shift, and an additional codon is added. This means that we have one extra amino acid, hello, here it is, um, but the otherwise they are unchanged on each side, aren't they? When they're in three separate places, this is a bit different because we are causing a frame shift when we add in our interfering little base one, interfering little base two. But you notice that when you add three bases together, you've basically added another codon. So yes, the amino acid sequence may be changed and the codons are changed, but after the third addition, when you've added this base back in, all of the codons afterwards are going to be in the correct reading frame again. So these have a potential to be unchanged. Next up, we need to think about two reasons why this might not affect the amino acid sequence and the resulting polypeptide. So you have these two different situations here where either the codon's unaffected and we need to talk about the degenerate code. Those are our two reasons to get our two marks. So first off, the replacement base might be the same as the original codon. If you see, we would have read ATT and then GAC using the original base there. But if the base you insert is exactly the same, this amino acid at least will be fine. It will be the same one. So we have the same codon encoded, the same amino acid produced. Alternatively, we've changed that so we've got ATT and this time instead of a GAC, we've got GAG. So using what we know about degenerate code, we can say the codon might change to another codon, it's different, it's not GAC anymore, but it's for the same amino acid. So, same amino acid will be produced. The next section of my class's booklet is to do with some lovely practice exam questions. So, either listen along with me as we go through how to interpret it, or you can give it a good shot right now. Let's look at our first question together. We have a diagram and it shows us the sequence of bases and a short length of mRNA. So if you didn't read that question and you didn't read that fact, the fact we have uracils knocking about is a sign that we're talking about you, oh, sorry, mRNA already. So we need to place a cross in the box next to the letter that shows the DNA sequence, which is complementary to the first four of these bases. So DNA, we know that the bases in DNA are, have a little think, we have A, we have T, we have C, and we have G. So these are the letters we should be using. That means already this one's off. 
This one's very exciting. Option D, we've got uracil and thymine in the same molecule. See you later. Next up, again, we've got thymine and uracil being friends over here too. That can't happen because DNA doesn't have uracil as one of the bases. It's only mRNA that will use uracil in place of thymine. So that means the only possible option has to be A. Next off, we have a question to sort some things out where we have to state the maximum number of amino acids coded for by this length of mRNA. So we need to think, how does the genetic code work? How do I select one amino acid? How many bases of mRNA do I need? Here's my beautiful handwriting. There we go. The next one is named the process, so simple A01 recall by which mRNA is formed in the nucleus. There are so many hints in this question. First off, they're making mRNA. Secondly, it's in the nucleus. There's only one process that could be. So let's look through. Um, using our diagram, let's look at how we'd read it. And we know that we need to have three bases of mRNA. We use triplet code so we can read off our triplets. We know that there are three bases in one codon, so we're going to read our codons, and each codon will give us an amino acid. There's our link. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different codons, so eight different amino acids can be made. Secondly, transcription is the process we're looking for. In our next bit of the question, you've got some lovely um, molecules that we have not directly taught you about. We need to apply our knowledge to this new information. So either um, have a look through yourself and give it a go or listen along and we'll try and take apart some of those pieces. So the first thing I'm going to pay attention to is that wherever I read about phenylalanine, that is an amino acid. We know it's found in proteins. So in most people, it's converted to another amino acid, tyrosine, by an enzyme, as shown in the diagram below. So here we see our process where we start off with phenylalanine, and then using this molecule here, which hasn't been named yet, but we do know that it's converted by an enzyme. So I know this arrow represents phenylalanine being converted by this enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase, to the product, which is another protein, or tyrosine. So to summarise what we know, I might write down here that this is an amino acid, this is an enzyme, and this is another amino acid. So let's get back to the question. Phenylketonuria is a result of a gene mutation. People with phenylketonuria cannot convert phenylalanine to tyrosine. So I might make a little note to myself saying that this can't happen if we have uh, phenylketonuria. I would write it out, but it's really hard writing with a mouse, so I'm just going to draw an arrow instead. So let's look at our question. Explain why people with this gene mutation cannot convert phenylalanine to tyrosine. You have four marks to think about why there might be a problem with this genetic mutation stopping this process. Now at the moment it still might seem very cryptic, but we know this process is catalyzed by the enzyme. So if I'm not converting this to tyrosine, then there must be a problem with my enzyme. So we know that enzymes are a type of tertiary protein. So you're thinking back to the facts that we know already. If I have a mutation in a gene, why does that affect enzymes? If this enzyme is affected, why is that process going to be affected? So have a look through, give it another go. The next one is more direct. Why would a gene mutation involving the replacement of a single base with another has a less effect than the loss of a base? So if you think about your codes, we could just be swapping out, let's say, somewhere over here. Instead of having an adenine, you might just throw in a guanine instead. What effect would that have on the overall protein? Compared to a second scenario where you just chopped out that adenine entirely and you lost it. What would happen to the way um, that gene is read? So, let's have 
a look at our answers. In the first part, we know that if we have a change in the DNA sequence or the base sequence of a gene, that will give you one mark already, that this is going to affect the amino acid structure. So remember, this was talking about this enzyme, which is a protein, and why it would be affected by gene mutation. We know how proteins are made. We say the DNA is affected first. That affects the primary structure. Still linking to the primary structure, that means that there might be a different R group present. And if there's a different R group present, you're going to have different bonding. And this means that there's going to be a change in shape of the active site. So remember when we talked about our tertiary structures being affected. If we change the bonding in our protein that would form the enzyme, it's going to change shape because um, there might be, sorry, I'll try that again. Uh, so when you have a, an issue with the tertiary structure that affects the shape of the active site, the active site needs to fit its substrate, which is phenylalanine. So you could say either phenylalanine or the substrate does not fit in the enzyme's active site, therefore cannot convert the substrate into the product, which would be tyrosine. Let's look at the second question next. So, looking at our answers, uh, we could first off say that if we lose an amino acid, there will be a frame shift, or the reading frame is going to change. And this is going to change the whole amino acid. If you replace only one codon or amino acid, it might not change the whole amino acid. And it says, if the third base, um, and the idea is here that we're thinking about degenerate code, um, the idea that the number of amino acids names the same, we are not changing the whole sequence, we're not making more or less amino acids if you substitute a single one. All you're doing is changing what would be one codon with a different codon. If you change the codon, you have the potential to change a single amino acid. Compared to if you lose that section, so if you lose that base altogether, then you have, oops, then you have to change the reading frame because instead of reading 1, 2, 3 for one codon and 1, 2, 3 including that base you deleted, now that's going to have to stretch over to the next one which will take its position. So we have a loss of one amino acid causing a frame shift or you replace a single codon and you may not affect the overall structure of the protein. So there you go, that is our full lesson so far, where you've now explained the effects of mutations on the protein structure and function. Again, any questions, feel free to send me an email. Um, if you're in my class, have a lovely day. See you later.